Hi, my name is Bianca Pichola. I'm the CEO of SIX, and welcome to the Generation Mining Live Investor Summit. I'd like to start today by introducing our presenters, Carrie Knoll, Executive Chairman, Jamie Levy, President and CEO, Rob Thomas, Vice President Exploration, John McBride, Senior Exploration Geologist, and Phil Walker, Lead Geological Director. To kick things off, Carrie and Jamie will be telling the company's story, and then Rod, John, and Phil will talk about the geology. At the end, we'll be accepting questions. You can submit your questions in the Q&A panel on the right hand side of your screen. Now, without further ado, take it away, Carrie. Thanks, Bianca. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for all uh, attending the uh, event today. Uh, it looks like we've got a pretty good turnout. So uh, just to introduce the company to those of you that are new to the story, um, I think most of you probably know that the um, Generation Mining acquired a 51% interest in the largest undeveloped palladium project in North America in July of last year. And we have an option to increase that interest to 80%. And that, that increase is going to probably be uh, uh, completed, if not by the end of this year, early uh, sometime uh, next year. Um, one of the first things we did was an independent resource calculation. We went back to first principles uh, to the original drill intercepts and, and recalculated everything. And the numbers came out pretty much as, as they had in the past. Uh, so uh, an estimate of 8.6 million ounces of measured and indicated palladium equivalent. That puts us in the top tier of, of precious metal projects uh, in, in the world. Um, plus another small uh, inferred of 915,000 palladium equivalent ounces. And one of the things that uh, makes this project really special is that it's, it's, it's located with excellent infrastructure. We've got highway, rail, power, uh, and there's a town nearby, a mining town. We completed a PEA uh, within six months of acquiring the project. We announced those results in, in January, and the results are good. This is a this is a mine at any foreseeable palladium prices, uh, and, and you can find the results of that uh, PEA on our website if you want to delve further into it. But today we're going to be talking about exploration, um, and and the, one of the questions we get is why are we doing exploration when we've already got uh, uh, almost 10 million ounces in all the different categories. And, uh, and, and it is a good question because we've only included about 37 or 38 percent of our resource uh, in the in the PEA. So we've got a lot of a, a lot of uh, mineralized material that has not uh, not yet been put into any kind of a mine plan. So why are we exploring? Well, the reason is is because we think that there's a really good opportunity to find some very high grade material on this property. The geology indicates that the um, um, the sampling that we've done indicates it, and, and that's what we're here to talk about today, how we're approaching this project and, and, and where we're going from here. So we're gonna start off with uh, Phil Walford. Phil is a director of the company, but he was previously president and CEO of a company called Marathon PGM, which owned this. And he's been associated with the project uh, for many, many years. And he's gonna talk about kind of the history of discovery on this, on this property. So I'm gonna now turn this over to Phil. Thank you, Carrie. The uh, project, the main area that we're looking at was developed from about 1985 to 2010 by various companies, eventually owned by Marathon PGM. Uh, it was also worked on by a, another company called uh, Geomac Exploration. In, with Geomac Exploration, I was a VP of Exploration, and with Marathon, I was the uh, CEO, President CEO. So I spent over 10 years on this project and uh, watched it grow. Uh, over 200,000 meters of drilling have been completed on the project. A lot of that was done by Marathon PGM and the results of the drilling were significant. We expanded the what we call the main zone, the main resource, and to the south of it, we also discovered the W horizon. Uh, which has got some significantly high grades in it. The other thing that W Horizon has it had in it, and we could see that in, on surface and in core, were fragments of massive sulfide deposit of massive sulfides, and these were quite looked like they've been ripped up from a deeper source. And when we assayed them, they were very high in uh, PGMs in particular. So that's that was something that was significant, uh, and that's part of the story that we're going to hear today. 
the Stillwater took over Marathon in 2010. Uh, they paid um, 118 million dollars for the project, and they sold 25% of it to Mitsubishi for 81 million in 2012. The project was shelved in 2014 due to low uh, palladium prices and a higher capex from the results of the Stillwater work. Savanye uh, Gold acquired Stillwater in 2017, and Generation bought the initial interest from Savanye in uh, 2019, and they can bring the ownership to 80% by spending uh, 10 million Canadian in four years. There is a back end right of it. Uh, they can, Savanya can reacquire an additional 31% uh, by paying 31% of the capex on a production decision. I'm just going to have a quick look at the geology here. Oops. Uh, this is the uh, a geological map of the Colville complex, which is only really a part of it. The purple zone is where we're finding all the mineralization. One of the, what we found with Marathon PGM was that the Two Duck Lake Gavra, which is the purple, had most of the mineralization in it, although Jordan Lake's a little different. What's significant here is that there are multiple pulses of mineralization along the border of this complex. And you can see there as Kerry noted before, there's significant uh, resource of platinum palladium, also uh, equivalent in the Marathon deposit. In, at Geordie Lake, there's a smaller resource at Sally. And then Boyer is a new zone that, uh, that uh, John and Rod are going to talk about. And so I, I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of the development of this, uh, of this district, really. And uh, I'll leave it now for uh, John and to Rod to continue with the geology. Thank you, Phil. So the project is located uh, 10 kilometers north of the town of Marathon, which is approximately 300 kilometers east of the city of Thunder Bay, which has an international airport, or 400 kilometers north of Sault Ste. Marie. It has uh, excellent infrastructure, as Kerry mentioned, or we're right off the Trans-Canada Highway, there are CP rail lines close by. There's two deep water ports on Lake Superior. Uh, the east-west tide line from Wawa to Thunder Bay is stabilizing power in northwestern Ontario with a new 230 kilovolt transmission corridor. And we're also 30 kilometers west of the famous Hemlo Mines. So we're in a very mining friendly region with a very skilled workforce. Our land package is over 220 square kilometers. And the geological map we saw earlier, we're focused on the eastern half of that, which is the most prospective ground. And we recently acquired uh, new ground uh, for areas that were undervalued previously, and we believe there's a lot of potential, which is the Boyer Zone. So there are a very limited number of PGM districts in the world. Uh, they're mostly limited to Norilsk in Russia, South Africa, the Bushveld, Stillwater um, in Montana. And there's one fundamental piece that you need for any good PGM district. You need a source of magma deep down carrying little bits of PGMs rising to the surface for us and then concentrating for us to exploit. And the Superior region is a new up and coming PGM district. There's a lot of interest in this area. And what happened 1.1 billion years ago, the earth tried to rip itself apart, um, creating a new ocean. So and it failed. So Lake Superior is actually a failed ocean. And because of that ripping event, it allowed a, a pathway for magma deep in the earth to come to the surface. And so we're, this is a close up of Lake Superior region. And what we see is a geological map of all the rocks associated with that mid-continental rift. And so the Marathon Project is that big purple blob here on the northeast shore of Lake Superior, and the Marathon Palladium Copper Deposit is part of that complex. On the south shore, we have the Eagle Deposit, which is currently being mined by Lindeen. It's a high-grade, small nickel copper PGM deposit. Tamarock on the west coast, the huge Duluth complex, with lower grade material over northern Minnesota, and all the small intrusions around Thunder Bay. 
there's a lot of interest in this area, not bought just by junior companies, um, but major players such as Rio Tinto, Sabanier, Implaz, Tech, and Figasto. There's a lot of eyes on this region because it's an up and coming district. So there's two major events for mineralization in the superior region. There's early events which tend to be PGM dominant, and there's later larger events which tend to be nickel, copper dominant, uh, which are the Duluth complex, Beaver Bay complex, whereas the Eagle deposit and Coldwell complex are the earlier PGM dominant. The difference with the Coldwell complex, it's huge. Um, the complex itself is 25 kilometers in diameter, and recent work with government mapping and geochemistry research with university groups, we've actually been able to increase that fingerprint to 120 kilometer radius. And why that's important is because to create these large PGM deposits, you need a massive amount of magmatic flow to move through these areas. And if you have a small little fingerprint, only so much may move through that little fingerprint. When you have something that's 120 square or kilometer radius, you know a lot of materials been moving through there. A lot of those little bits of PGMs are coming up through our system. So this is again the geological map uh, that Phil was talking about. We're not going to be able to just talk about one project. This isn't one deposit that we're working on. Generation mining has complex that we're working in. We have three mineral resources. We have multiple exploration grounds. The perspective ground, that purple rock that we're looking at on the outside is almost 30 kilometers in strike length. We have the Geordie deposit, which is in the center of the um, complex. And all that area in between, although it's buried under uh, cyanide cap, is perspective for mineralization as that purple rock dips back towards the center of the complex. In 2020, we released an updated resource, as Bill said, on the Marathon Palladium Copper Deposit, 179 million tons uh, at over 7 million Palladium equivalent ounces. We updated our Geordie deposit, indicated resource of 17.3 million tons, and we released our first resource in our Sally deposit, uh, which is 21.8 million tons at uh, 767,000 Palladium equivalent ounces. And then we have a plethora of exploration targets uh, throughout this package, but we can't talk about them all. So we're going to talk about the Boyer zone. It's a uh, new discovery for high PGM zones, but there's also um, some geophysical signatures there that are really pushing the boundaries and the growth of the complex and where we can actually explore. So this is the detailed mineral resource table, and you can you review this in the report or it's on our website. The key points we want to take away from this are that the tonnage in the marathon uh, picture straight model is dominantly measured and indicated with very little inferred. It is well drilled, it's well understood, and we're moving that to the stability study. The jewelry deposit um, in the center of the complex is palladium dominant. Um, you can see that it's um, 0.56 grams per pound palladium, 0 0.04 platinum, so very heavy on palladium. And then again, our Sally deposit, brand new resource, and it's been put together with about 60 drill holes. We'll get to that um, later on. So we're getting into the geology. Um, uh, we'll focus in on the main marathon deposit. And this is because we have over 900 drill holes in this area. We have geophysics. It's very well understood uh, from a technical point of view. And it's where we base a lot of our understanding of the overall complex. So on the left-hand side, it's a plan view map. The black outline is the um, pit shelf from the 2020 PEA. And from top to bottom of the resource is about three kilometers. West is about 500 meters, and uh, the plant pit will be about 350 meters deep. There's two portions to our um, deposit, which Phil alluded to. The northern half above that AA line is what we call the main deposit. The south is what we call our W horizon. Fundamentally, um, they're in the same rock type, it's the same timing, but there's different processes that are occurring where in the southern half we get really high grade PGM zones. Everything is dipping back to the west at about 35 degrees, which you can see on the right-hand side in the cross-section. And in 2019, our last drill program, we, for the first time, drilled the down dip 
extension of the main deposit in holes 537 and 538 being almost 100 meter thick intervals of mineralization. And so it's still open to depth, and now we know the direction to go after it. Rod, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, so if I could just point out on this slide, the that purple zone that John alluded to. So that we show it here as dipping moderately to the west, but really that's just an interpretation. And as John will show on subsequent slides, there's potential for that dip to flatten out actually into a series of steps like features, which may have provided a structural trap for massive sulfide mineralization to accumulate. And as Phil mentioned out, we do see evidence of bits and pieces of that massive sulfide material in the upper parts of the uh, areas that we drilled. Perfect, thank you. The, so moving on to geology, I won't bore you too much with the geology. Um, I'll go through the fundamentals where the number one, the green rock is our basement. It's a uh, Archean intermediate volcanic. And this is important because it is hard, it is distinct, and it is represented in geophysics um, separately from our intrusions. And the purple rock, which is our two duct like gabbro, number five, which hosts the um, calcopyrite pyrotite um, PGM copper mineralization, intrudes along that boundary and conduits in tube shaped um, in this stepping pattern and depositing the calcopyrite and mineralization. You can see the resource mineralization is right to surface, whether you're at the Marathon deposit, the Sally deposit, Geordie deposit, or Boyer, um, we can see this at surface and they extend down uh, through these conduits. And they're intruded as breccias um, moving upwards from depth. Looking at the mineralization, so again, what we're looking at is a plan view map of the Marathon deposit. Again, the red box outlines that northern portion, the main zone. The purple box outlines the W horizon. They're distinctly different. And what the contour map underneath is, is that footwall boundary, because most of the mineralization is controlled as in tubes or half bowl shapes um, along these boundaries. So the main zone here in the red box is a north-south tube and it's a channelized, whereas the southern portion occurs in multiple little tubes and um, trend back to the to the west. And we see that both in palladium and in copper. And so that so we our mineralization is bounded along in the two dock lake gabbro along the football boundary. But it's also coincidence they trend back to our fault structures. So just like in the big system, the magma from depth um, rising through a structure to get to surface, you need it in the local deposit scale as well. You need a weak point for that magma to move through. And luckily in the Coldwell complex, we have a plethora of fault structures, both radial and concentric faulting that allow this magma to move through. And so we can vector in on these structures to help guide us towards mineralization. And that is also a benefit when we're trying to go down dip on these uh, mineralized zones, because not only can we use geophysics, which most projects use, we can also have a directionality to it through our fault structures, which most projects don't have. Focusing on the marathon deposit, again, the red um, zone is the mineralization in the marathon deposit, the purple is the mineralization in the W horizon. They're fundamentally different. We're in the main zone. It's still cal it's calcopyrite, puritite, disseminated um, ore, but it's very thick and continuous. So our, our drill hole last year, 533, we had 96 meters at 0.45% copper and 1.22 uh, grams per ton total PGMs. And it's open to, uh, in what we call the channelist zone to the north over here, which we won't have time today to talk about, but the deposit is open in that direction. And there's a keel shape here, which goes along this fault plane, which is also open to depth, which we know because of holes 537 and 538 of last year's drilling. Whereas in the W horizon, we have these high grade PGM intercepts, both 306 as 10 meters at the same grade, copper grade as the main zone, 0.45%, but has 21 grams per ton palladium, almost 10 grams per ton platinum, and a little bit of gold 
And again, we see this over 1.2 kilometer strike length of these high grade intercepts. But the mineralization is slightly different. It's dominated in calcopyrite and bornix, these high copper um, sulfide phases. Rod, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, so the, uh, I'd just like to point out the, the scientific literature has characterized the W horizon as being a zone of extreme PGE enrichment and has some of the highest grade PGE intercepts in the world. And current ore deposit models suggest that similar to Norilsk, so that huge volumes of magma would have needed to move through the system, perhaps as much as 10,000 times of what we actually see in the marathon deposit itself. And as John mentioned earlier, the feeder zones through which the magma moved and which were responsible for forming the W horizon and the main zone at marathon, they appear at surface as fault scarps or cliffs. So although there are in excess of a thousand drill holes on the property, only a handful have drilled below 600 meters. And so the next few slides where we show that the, the deposit is open at depth, that the deposit itself is only drilled off uh, to a few hundreds of meters. So just bear that in mind uh, going forward. Thanks, John. Perfect. So looking at more detail in the mineralization, again, we're looking at that purple zone, the W horizon. And what we're seeing here is the distribution of palladium specifically. So purple is anything over two grams, but it goes all the way up to 70 grams per ton over a two meter interval. And again, we can point out on the slide where hole 306 and hole 304 from the 07 drilling was. And what we notice is that they are, they're forming in these bowls, but they're also open to depth and trending along the fault structure and have not been defined and um, by drilling. So they're open-ended. And this, well, when we get to our exploration, this is what we're going to be focusing on this year. Looking at the same thing, palladium distribution in our marathon deposit is, it, this is more of a, a copper dominated portion of the deposit. There's still um, very good PGM grades throughout it. Um, mineralization, again, is open in this channelist zone to the top. And with the recent drilling in 537, 538 is open down these um, conduit here. In 538, um, again, vertical depth is less than or just about 600 meters, we are getting um, higher grade intercepts further down within the conduit. So half percent copper, but over seven grams per ton total PGMs. PGM, palladium to platinum ratio in the marathon deposit is about three to one. So why do we think we can go down dip to find more higher grade material? Um, it's because we have three dominant styles of mineralization throughout the complex. Most deposits have one, maybe two. They're dominantly disseminated ores, and you might get little pieces of early massive sulfides. But because we have this really high grade W horizon material that's running you know, 56 grams per ton, um, 70 grams per ton material, the way to form that is you as you have all this magma moving through a very narrow conduit um, carrying little bits of PG, those PGMs need sulfur to be sucked out of the magma. And so the magma is picking up sulfur, um, that sulfur sucking out the PGMs in one pulse, and then it moves up the system and gets settles out. The problem is sulfur is very heavy and it wants to sink back down through the system. It will sink back down and keep recharging and recharging and doing this over and over. In typical deposits, you end up with disseminated ores, very typical to what our marathon main zone is. But with the W horizon, it has to occur dozens and dozens of times. And that recirculation is upgrading your sulfur source at the base um, further down. So the red outline is our marathon deposit and the source for this upgrading uh, this extreme upgrading is further down within this conduit. We also have, when we'll get to this, but at the Sally deposit, have identified these upgraded massive sulfides um, there. So we have the system, we have the, um, the direction, and we know the system can create it. So how do we go and find these? So because we, we know they exist, we have the model that suggests that they should exist. It's in 2018, we partnered with a European group to develop passive seismic. And in 2018, 
we did our first survey and for the first time we're able, able to see below the 500 meter depth and what we came up with was this image of our footwell contact which is green and it's in that stepping pattern and then the red is the representation of our gabbros and the stepping pattern isn't unique to us it's what you see in most or all um, conduit intrusive systems because as it, again you have to move magma from depth to surface they're using structures and there's a vertical and horizontal component to these and once it's great that you can now move magma through but you need physical traps just like a river to deposit these so you could have um, a bend a 90 degree bend where magma you know slows down at that bend depositing out the sulfur you could have a narrow conduit going into a wide void just like a river going into a lake it's going to drop everything as it hits that lake or because sulfur is so dense once it's upgraded it will sink back down and clogging pipes so the image on the top right is an idealized cross-section of an evolved magma conduit. So if you have an open system with massive amounts of magma and sulfur source, you can create deposits like Norilsk. If you have um, a lot of sulfur accumulation, sulfide accumulation and back draining down the system, you can create deposits like the Eagle Deposit. And the Eagle Deposit is just across the lake from us within the same system. The larger uh, mid-continental rift around Superior can create high-grade massive sulfide deposits and there's no reason that their occurrence can occur in the cold well complex down dip from what we see at marathon on a side note the passive seismic also identified these high velocity targets that have a similar velocity to our eastern gabbros um, these are at depth and are secondary structures to the main um, direction to our marathon deposit and these are additional high velocity exploration targets um, we won't get into today but are there so what our exploration 2020 program looks like is we're going to do magnetic telluric surveys at the marathon and sally deposit they're all ongoing right now the marathon um, survey started uh, last friday uh, we're looking to do a test survey for mobile metal ions and to test the response. This is a great technique to identify which conduits uh, we want to look at and could be mineralized or prospective ground up at Boyer. Uh, we're going to drill 5,000 meters to test the MT targets at Marathon and potentially Sally. And we're going to focus a lot of that drilling around the high grade uh, near resource mineralization at the W horizon around hole 306. And then we're going to expand exploration through boots on the ground early prospecting mapping at our undervalued Boyer zone. This is an area where we identify those high-grade PGMs, low copper zones, um, other companies previously missed, and uh, work in that area to, to add to that pipeline of early exploration. So we have a spectrum of early targets, gener target generation to uh, feasibility within this complex. So this is, again is that uh, palladium distribution map of the W horizon at uh, hole 306 we have the down dip extension of it we're going to focus from here and try to add to that near resource and follow up with um, hopefully more intercepts of high grade PGMs uh, the magnetic tiller survey we're going to do at our marathon and Sally project um, another mid continental rift project owned by transmission transition metals and implants their Sunday Lake project conducted a MT survey back in 2018. They drilled those targets in 2019 and 2020 and successfully intercepted uh, mineralization. So we know the MT survey does work in the main continental rift in this environment. And what you can see here is there's that 600 meter depth line across the page. So their targets are all the way down to 1500 meters where we have a lot of room between that 600 and 1500 meter depth to explore for these higher grade materials. And you can also see that the mineralization is occurring on one of these flats. Again, it's, it's the physical trap that's isolating these. Yes, so, oh, so uh, yeah, no worries. So that's an ex this is an ex excellent example of the exploration potential west of that, of the Marathon deposit. So here again on, on, the, uh, on the right hand side, 
there's no drilling below that 600 meter level. Yet we have we have that well developed feeder zone responsible for all that mineralization near surface in the Marathon deposit itself. The geolog geological setting in, in both is very similar, and that step like feature which uh, which underlies the Marathon deposit itself may may well re repeat as we go below that 600 meter level. So that, from our perspective, is an excellent uh, area to explore, and hopefully the MT will will light that up in terms of massive sulfide targets. Moving on to our Sally deposit, the the red outline is the um, mineralization for the current resource. It is hosted in the Two Duck Lake Gabo, just like Marathon. It's calcopyrite, puritite dominant interstitial material, just like our Marathon deposit. In and what we see in that uh, in that drilling is we have a peridotite unit, the blue unit here, and right and it's it's an early intrusion, and right on top of it we have high grade palladium PGM mineralization, so five grams up to ten grams per ton uh, material sitting right on top of it. So in 2014, what we did is we went beyond the Coldwell complex into the foot wall, pushing that boundary to look along this contact of that blue unit. And what we came up with was grab samples of massive sulfide. So whole our grab sample in the top right there, 8054, um, 188 grams per ton material, 9% copper, a little bit of nickel, and then again, 5603, 230 grams per ton PGMs, 5.5% uh, copper, 1.4% nickel. And in 2017, we successfully drilled our first massive sulfide intercept along the contact of this um, prototype unit um, where we get up to um, 4.3 grams per ton palladium, 2.16% copper, and almost 1% nickel. So it was proof of concept that these high grade material does exist in the complex. Uh, the next question is where is it preserved and where does it accumulate? So our targets at Sally is in 2000, uh, 19, we conducted a passive seismic survey again um, because it was able to see below that 500 meter depth. And it came up with a um, velocity target, um, which is the big red blob here. Um, it ranges almost from 400 meters to 1500 meters depth and has a lateral extent of 1200 meters. It is the same size, shape, direction, and velocity or density as what we see for our, our prototype, that blue unit. And if you compare it to Eagle, it has the boot shape. It has this vertical component neck and there's a 90 degree bend and it flattens out. And what they found at the Eagle deposit just to the south um, of the lake is it has this vertical component with a flattening and right at the flattening is where the sulfides are getting trapped because you have back draining and that's where they're getting stuck. So this is our main target for uh, drilling this, tar uh, this, this anomaly. We're not going to do this blind. That's why we're doing an MT survey in this area. It's going to help pick which areas to target first for uh, conductivity for those massive fault flights accumulating there. And then our cold oil complex boundary. We're, um, for the last decade, we've been very fixated on um, the limitations of that geological boundary on the outside but because of the success we're having at sally with intrusions going beyond that boundary with massive sulfides being beyond that boundary we have staked a um, ground north of our boyer zone and we did that because the eastern gabbros including the two Lake gabbro which is mineralized has a very unique magnetic signature and so it's the blue in that image to the right and what we see is this extends for five kilometers past that traditional boundary. And so the, the MMI, um, regional prospecting, other geophysics, this is a great opportunity to really push those boundaries for additional exploration targets. So the highlights of the project are that this isn't just one little project we're talking about. It's a complex. We have three resources, a plethora of exploration targets. A lot I couldn't even fit into today's talk that are all excellent uh, targets. Uh, we're in a mildly friendly jurisdiction with wonderful infrastructure. Uh, we have multiple, um, our mineralization with multiple deposits that's open along strike and down dip. 
we're moving um, the marathon project towards feasibility. Uh, the coal oil complex has three styles of mineralization. We're not just looking for one deposit style, we're looking for large disseminated deposits near the surface. We're looking for reef style, high grade PGM zones like Boyer or W Horizon. And we're looking for potential massive sulfides at Sally Marathon and any other conduit uh, because there's so many, but those are the ones we're focusing on right now. And this new large footprint um, at the W Horizon is really pushing where we can look and opening up real estate for new discoveries. Jamie, to you. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, just, just to go back uh, on some of the stuff that John was mentioning here, um, and we just kind of jumped over it. When, when, when Marathon uh, was sold to Stillwater in 2010, um, it was a, a copper project with a PGM credit. Um, Stillwater, for the years, uh, for a couple of years, did a completed internal feasibility study, um, had attempted to put this into production. They uh, had did uh, completed very little exploration. All the money, the 30, 40 million dollars, was all into permitting um, and into to, 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 to moving this project um, into um, into a production sort of stage. Again, when Stillwater had it in 2013, it was um, a copper project with a PGM credit. When we acquired it in 2019, um, obviously with the pricing of uh, palladium, when it was around $1,200 when we um, optioned the project from Sabani, it started to become a PGM um, uh, uh, um, deposit with a copper credit. So we, as today, as we can see in the prices, it's a complete disconnect from what, what, is, what it was back in the day. So it is an entirely different project, even though it's the same rock in the ground, but the economics are different. Where copper used to be 40 or 50 percent, now it's PGMs upwards of 50 and 60 percent as, as the revenue going forward. Um, and one other thing that we just jumped over as well, the project had uh, the majority of the drilling was done around the mar marathon deposit. Since that time, Stillwater did acquire some land. John um, uh, John uh, staked some land for us when we originally acquired the project to the uh, north of Sally or to the northeast of Sally. So there's been a, a bunch of ground that uh, hasn't even been prospected yet. So it is a, a massive complex, like uh, John said, 220, uh, 220 square kilometers, and the majority of this drilling has been completed in um, the Marathon deposit, with very little has been completed since 2010. Um, so I just wanted to kind of make sure we, we, we realize that there's a, a big expiration potential on the project, not, not only down dip of the project, uh, of the deposit, the marathon deposit itself. I'm um, just going into the management team we can jump on. Um, uh, Drew Anwell just came as our chief operating officer, a uh, bunch of uh, years at Detour. Um, uh, Placer Dome and Barrick, Rod Thomas, who you've talked about, you can see his uh, uh, resume looks pretty good. John uh, has been on the project since 2007. Um, Tabitha has been with the project a little bit longer than John, but uh, they were uh, Stillwater employees and then Savannah employees, and they came over when we acquired. Uh, Patty and, and Brian are um, on the accounting side. Brian's a good CFO. And Carrie, I think you're better talking about yourself. Why don't you get through that if you can, <laughs> just for the people that don't know. Yeah, so, um, well, I, I, I just like to say that I've founded uh, six companies in my career and four of them made it into production. So, I, uh, I, I and this, uh, I intend to be the fifth, I'll just say that. So, so Kerry's uh, quite modest, um, so um, he's, he's had a great, um, a great track record here. Um, our independent board, um, Phil Walford, um, who spoke earlier, um, Phil was the president of this original uh, Marathon PGM when it got taken over by Stillwater for $118 million. Then he went off to Marathon Gold. Uh, he put that into pre-feasibility pre study. Now he's retired from that um, and wanted to come back to Marathon, so he's back on our board. Paul Murphy uh, was just on the board of uh, Continental that got taken over uh, by the Chinese. Alamos is the chairman of that, um, and he's um, uh, ex-head of mining of uh, PwC, um, so he's had a very um, very good track record as well. Steve Reefer, geophysicist, very good to have on our side, especially now that we're doing some uh, geophysical work. And Cashel Meager is our last addition, so we have the independent board um, with the four of them here. Cashel Meager is chief operating officer of HUD Bay um, and likes this uh, project um, as most other people do or should. Um, just going back to the economics of the project, we just jumped over it. That's not really the purpose of the call, but um, the purpose of the call is obviously the expiration because we want to show everybody that this project isn't limited to this the deposit. And we hear other companies talking about expiration upsides and massive sulfides and feeder zones or whatever all the, the, the terms of the day are. We have all of that. And then we also have almost you know 9 million ounces of uh, 
palladium equivalent in the ground. So we have a good safety net, or I'd say a fabulous safety net relative what the other exploration companies have out there. Um, and, and I think we jumped over the PEA numbers earlier, but we acquired the project in the uh, spring. We put out a PEA, or sorry, summer of last year, the beginning of this year, we put a PEA numbers out. They almost seem um, boring right now because palladium prices um, were at 1275 uh, when we did the PEA, and obviously they're closer to eighteen or nineteen hundred dollars now, so the the numbers will change. But even at twelve hundred seventy five dollar palladium, we had an after tax IR of thirty percent and MPV of eight hundred seventy million dollars. At the end of the year, we were we just did a quick little snapshot of what it was at nineteen hundred and twenty dollars palladium, which is I think where it is today, and we had a MPV of one point five billion dollars and an IRR of. Uh, for just under 46 percent i think the payback was uh, just over a year and a half so really good economics uh the palladium cash costs uh we can talk about this as a gold equivalent because even though we can't but you know where you see a gold company with a all in sustaining cash cost of five 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 hundred eighty six dollars us um and you can see where palladium's trading at now it's um those are very good numbers to have um going forward uh, our share structure here uh, we have 130 million shares outstanding we have just uh, i believe around 14 million in the bank. Um, our market cap, uh, I don't know if we're around 40 cents, but call it around $50 million. Um, Eric came in the last financing at 52 cents, uh, along with the Cisco um, and, and the Zebra. So you can see we have a pretty good shareholder base. Sabani is still the larger shareholder. Um, and when we bought the project from them or optioned the project from them, we gave them $3 million in cash and $3 million in shares. They asked for shares, um, not all cash. So that's how they got their 8.5% uh, ownership here. So Kerry, my myself and a bunch of board of management uh, make up that 7%. I think we're probably a little bit higher than that, but uh, I think that's a, that's a good number we could talk about now. So um, the, we have a very good registry, I believe, um, and uh, and I think, uh, you know, this is, uh, as, as uh, we mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier, we have $14 million in the bank. That should be enough to take us through to the end of 2021. 20, uh, so by that time, uh, we don't really have our Gantt chart up here. But, um, you know, timeline would hopefully be that we could have a feasibility study complete uh, the first quarter of 2021 um, and some exploration news out um, all through the summer and fall coming up. So I think that was it. Gary, you have anything else to add here other than I think very good presentation, uh, Rod and John? Thank you. And Phil? No. I think no, there's a bunch of questions here. So I think we should probably get to the questions here before... Uh, get into the question period then. Can you still hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. My computer's acting up. Jamie, can you? Great. So here's what we're going to do then, uh, Carrie. Uh, I'll read out the questions to the group and, and then uh, why don't you guys tell me who should answer what? But we have a number of questions here. Uh, let's start from the top here. Uh, from Paul, what is the price of palladium forecast to be in the future? Are there any other palladium mines in the world coming online? Maybe, uh, Jamie, you want to answer that one? Or? Uh, I think it's Carrie's better on that one, I think. Go ahead, Carrie. I think I'll Carrie just sign off for a moment here. You did sign off? Okay, so uh, where do the questions go? The questions, uh, what is the price of palladium forecast where we're using? We haven't quite decided on, on, on what we're going to use for the feasibility study. Um, that's still up in the air. It would probably be around a two, three-year trailing average. Uh, the price of palladium, the biggest guys out there are Johnson and Mathe. They've stopped their forecast just because of COVID right now. Um, uh, from Metals Focus to um, to, to, to Johnson Mathy, um, they mentioned that Palladium is going to be in a deficit this year. It's how much of it is going to be in a deficit. Um, and, but I guess it just comes down to car um, uh, the demand for cars right now because that's the main usage of the Palladium right now. So um, I, I don't want to put a number out there, but I would say somewhere in the $1,500 to $2,500 range. I know it's a, it's a big range there. I just think it's... Uh, how, how how well the demand is going to come for cars and how cure, how fast we can find a cure for COVID right now. So I, I, I know it's a big range, but I think that's a, a comfortable range. Question here from Imro. Uh, actually, this one I, I can answer. Hi, will we get a recording later? Yes, you will. You will get a recording very shortly. Um, my hope is that you should have this in the next 24 hours or so. It's going to be on the Generation Mining website, across their social media channels, uh, or if for whatever reason you can't find it, feel free to reach out to Jamie or myself and we will make sure that you get it. Um, 
In terms of, uh, oh, here's one that's interesting. Coming from Pete, uh, can you give us your best guess as to what Sibania will choose to do once you release the definitive feasibility report? Jamie, do you want to try that one? Sure. Um, for for those of you that don't know, Sabani, Stillwater, um, they're the largest, I believe, the largest platinum producer in the world. They're second uh, palladium producer to um, uh, to to uh, Norilsk in Russia. They do almost four million ounces of PGM plus gold a year. Um, so they're a major company. Their market cap is hard to find out, but I think it's around the eight to ten million dollar range U.S. Um, this project, depending on, 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 on the feasibility numbers, would probably be doing somewhere around the two to 300,000 ounces of palladium a year, um, de de depending on the numbers. So for them to, to buy back in or to earn back in uh, and only have 51% of it, and the, the terms that we believe are, are, are um, expensive for them, I would believe that they'd either walk away or, or buy us out. Those are my top two. And then the third would be that they would earn back in. Great. Hopefully that answers your question. Carrie, do you have anything to add on that? No, that's good. Perfect. A uh, question here from Brian Fowler. He says, you appear to be mostly interested in the Bamboo's deposit on the and the Sally Lake deposit. Do you have any plans this year to do more work on the Geordie Lake and or incorporate the Geordie Lake deposit into future mine plans? John? Sure. So the Geordie deposit has a more of a copper dominant mineralization. And what we're focusing on right now is PGMs. Again, we have a lot of projects and a lot of targets to go after. We can't do them all in one year. And so we're focusing them on your resource at Marathon Deposit and then the potential we see to advance the Sally. Um, so the majority is there. It's just taking a backseat this year um, because of these other projects. To move forward, um, we'll look at the economics and um, see if it's viable to move into uh, our reserves going forward. Robert Rubley wants to know uh, what area will be the main focus for future drilling? So again, that is, so the 5,000 meters we're planning to do this year is around those high grade down dip uh, mineralization at the W horizon and the main feeder conduit focusing on the uh, MT targets and high grade. And then um, depending on the MT survey at Sally, hopefully drilling something in that area, um, but that's to be determined. Great. Hugo wants to know, is your goal to have the discovery uh, brought into production by you guys or to be uh, bought out? Sorry, Carrie, I'm going to answer that. Uh, the our plan is to, to, to build this. Uh, to build this, that's why we hired Drew. Um, I don't think Drew's on the call because he was on our last webinar. And um, as I mentioned earlier, sorry, I didn't get into all of Drew's background, but he has built mines before and a lot more complicated mines than this. So uh, we're ready to build it. He has a full staff uh, to build. Uh, the feasibility study hasn't officially started yet, but he's doing a bunch of trade-off studies right now. Um, so our, 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 our plan is to build it. Um, and if someone wants to take us out along the way because the economics are fabulous, so be it. But uh, as of right now, we're partners with Sabani and we're putting this into production. Great. Kurbani asks, what is the exploration budget for 2020? What is the cost associated associated to the feasibility study? And are you contemplating raising cash in the next six months? Okay, I'll, I'll answer that. The exploration budget right now is uh, uh, somewhere in the million and a half to two million dollar range. It's a uh, it's a small budget uh, for right now. Uh, that's about five thousand meters of drilling with some uh, the MMI work that uh, Rod and uh, John were talking about, and some magnetotellurics work. Um, uh, the budget is is getting devoted. The majority is getting uh, to the feasibility study, um, and uh, you know those those numbers will be released soon. But you know we anticipate that being the three to five million dollar range. Um, and I guess the last question is: We can contemplate and raise money. We know we have fourteen million in the bank, so uh, we're fine for money uh, right now. Um, you know, if we had a couple dollar share price, then we'd probably think about raising some money. But around here, we're not raising money. We don't need the money, um, and we have more than a cash enough cash to to get us through uh, to the uh, you know what we believe is uh, budgeted to the end of 2021. So almost 18 months. 
great. Uh, Kevin and Elizabeth both asked, can we see uh, the presentation in PDF format? I've gone ahead and uploaded the presentation in the handout section here. So if you want to download it, take a look, uh, you can find it in the handout section on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, next question here from Andrew. He asks, why is the market cap only 50 million for a deposit so large? Do you all agree that the market is giving uh, Genem no love? I'm curious you answer this because you've had sleep with nice about this. <laughs> yeah, hey, sorry, I was uh, my internet went down for a few minutes. We lost power at my house. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm looking for that question now. Um, Why are we trading so for so cheap when we have such a large resource? Well, um, I, I, I can't answer that 100%. And I think part of it is that we just got to continue marketing and tell the story. But one of the things I have noticed is that the us and the other palladium companies have not responded like the gold companies have to the to the rise in price. And that's despite the fact that palladium has um, outperformed gold significantly uh, over the last few years. Um, but that said, it is a precious metal. And I think it's time will come. And I think that uh, as, as uh, there's a lot of activity in our sector and as more discoveries are made and uh, there, there's some M&A activity, I think you're gonna see um, a, a situation where the sector really uh, starts to shine and, and it, it hasn't happened yet. It, it's had its brief moments. Uh, it, had a, it had a good time in January when uh, the price uh, almost doubled in the quarter month, but uh, then it came back down and, and, and away. Mm -hmm. Question here from Corbani. Uh, Bloomberg shows a Cisco is still a shareholder. Is that the case? Uh, are they still sellers? Um, they're still a shareholder. I cannot tell that they're selling or not selling. So um, I cannot answer that question. I hope they're not selling, but um, they're, they're, they're long stock. If they want to sell, they can sell. So we have a relationship with them, but... Um, that's all I can I'd like to add to that. Um, um, when we were buying this project back in uh, uh, early 2019, trying to get financing for it, they were our first order, a lead order of two and a half million dollars on an eight million dollar financing. And, and uh, you know, that was really uh, good of them to do that, to, to support us. So, you know, if they're if they are selling and I see that they have sold a bit of stock, if they're selling that that's their right. They're, they're probably taking some profit, but they they were there for us. And uh, I want to I, I want to acknowledge that. Question here from JP. I think parts of this have already been answered, but uh, in case people are signing in late, we'll circle back. Uh, he asked how much cash you have, which was answered. Um, what is the monthly burn and what is the time horizon for future exploration? Jamie, do you want to try that one? Um, the cash burn would be different if we're doing exploration and feasibility work. Um, so I, I, I can't really answer that question. I mean, there, there, there's a burn of head office in sight, but obviously it goes up a lot higher uh, when Drew has um, his uh, um, feasibility team worked out. Um, if you want to shoot me an email and I can get your breakdown if you want that, um, and I'll get um, someone on our accounting side, I cannot answer that. But as I mentioned to you before, when we budgeted our you know, 14 million or so, that will take us through to the end of 2021. Um, is kind of the best answer I could give you right now without telling you that we're spending $250,000 this month with drilling and the next month will be 500 because we got the uh, Quantex bill for the MT survey. So it, it, it kind of, I'm just averaging it out um, for um, the 18 months. But if you want, shoot me an email. It's on the website here. You can see it there and uh, I can get you a better answer if you like. And sorry, the second part of the question was? I, it's deleted now, so. Oh, no, it's under published. Uh, the second part of the question was, da, 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 da. Let us look here. Ah, um, monthly burn uh, and the time horizon for further exploration. Uh, as of right now, we have a budget again that we mentioned for the 5,000 meters of drilling and the MMI work and the, um, the magneto telluric work. So um, that's our, our, our budget for now. Um, things can change as um, our MT targets will come back from Quantec. And um, if something uh, looks uh, very, um, uh, as I like to call it technically, a very red blob and it looks like it needs to be drilled, uh, we might allocate uh, different funds uh, to, to drill the targets. But so right now we have certain drill targets that we're 
aiming at. And again, things can change. We could pivot on that very quickly. Um, it's nice to have that nest egg of cash in our um, in the bank account. The yeah, you know, the MT could be very compelling. Great. A question here uh, that says, "Is the PGM economic mineral braggite?" So that's a complicated question because the PGM suites in the deposit are variable depending if you're in the main zone or the W horizon or Sally. And those are one of the tools we use to understand which upgrading systems we have and these high grade sulfides we have uh, deeper down. Bragite does exist in the deposit, but the main zone is dominantly sulfide phases and arsenides and bismuthides. Whereas the W horizon is dominantly sulfides. And that distinction is uh, leads to our understanding of this deposit. So it, it's a complicated suite of PGM minerals. Great. I believe uh, there's over 70, uh, 70 uh, palladium platinum metals. Uh, sorry, uh, minerals in the deposit. That's true. And there's actually, um, we've discovered unique minerals to the cold well complex that don't occur uh, anywhere else so we've discovered cold well light marathonite do we have mcbrideite yet no you can't <laughs> name it after yourself <laughs> who says okay all right another question uh similar sort of vein pun very much intended um is marathon deposit genesis similar to sudbury uh, in canada or norl Noralisks in Russia. Noralisks. So, so go ahead, Rod. No, no, please go ahead. So Sudbury is very unique to the world. It's a one in a billion year event. Uh, that's a uh, crater impact from a meteor. Uh, and so it remelted everything. So no, it is not like Sudbury. It is closer to the Noralisk model. And if you remember the image I showed you of the cross section of an idealized plumbing system, Noralisks is in there. So is the eagle. There is a spectrum of deposits, and you can go from small high-grade deposits to massive disseminated upgraded deposits. And so the marathon is in there, and there's opportunity to move in both directions as we go down dip. Are you going to do a downhill EM survey? Victor wants to know. So any drill hole, we drill um, electro or um, electromagnetic targets from surface or MT work or whatever, we always do borehole EM on it. Yes. Great. This is one for you, Jamie. Uh, it comes from Andrew Delic. He says, given uh, COVID limitations, what are Generation's uh, investor awareness plans over the next three to six months on both the retail and institutional levels? Um. Uh, Kerry, myself, and I, I, I guess everyone here, John, Rod, Phil, uh, we're doing webinars as much as we can. Uh, we're doing as much uh, Zoom meetings as we can get out there. Uh, we did have some, Kerry and I, some good plans to go to Europe um, in uh, late spring. Obviously, that got canceled, and um, the, the big Beaver Creek conference that uh, everyone likes to go to in Colorado was canceled. So looks like uh, we're, we're, we're stuck to uh, Zoom calls right now. So um, not good for the air miles, but uh, it, it's... Uh, um, we're, we're, we're going to be stuck to phone calls and Zoom calls for the, the near term until we hear um, anything from um, on the COVID case. Um, and, and, and public uh, up at site, uh, John is taking care of that side. On, on another note, uh, John takes uh, safety very seriously. I don't know, John, if you wanted to get into that or not, but uh, he has a COVID policy for all our visitors and anybody else that comes to site, contractors. Yeah, so uh, we have, like Jamie said, we have a COVID policy um, in place. Um, we're following it very strictly. Uh, the, we're working with the town of Marathon. Um, there are no COVID cases in Marathon. There's, I think, only four active cases in Northwestern Ontario. Um, we're in phase two already. Um, so hotels are open. Um, hair dressers aren't yet, um, obviously. But um, we are working with them to to be able to manage to go to the field. We're starting with the MT survey, we're starting and we're working with companies that take COVID very seriously. They provide their policies and uh, Quantech who's on site right now doing the MT survey has a very good safety record and are doing a great job to minimize interactions with the town and to respect the COVID issue. 
Hey folks, I recognize that we're entering into overtime here. We have a handful, maybe five or six more questions. Are you guys, this guy's game to keep going or, uh, or should we save these for another time? I'm good. All right. And we go into overtime. So next question here is coming from, let's take this one from Pierre. Uh, could you differentiate what you will achieve from MT that you did not with EM? So we do have airborne um, EM surveys. They're regional scale. They pick up the Eastern Gabbro, give us some targets. They also pick up a lot of uh, Archean mineralization, puritite zones, pyrite zones in the football. Um, so they're not great for direct target base. They help us guide us to mineralized zones, which we've done. Ground-based EM is very difficult to do because of terrain, forest, um, without cutting lines, which is expensive and timely. The MT survey is gives us a 3D model, which we can integrate into our passive seismic, our gravity models, our magnetic models. Um, so we're looking at this not as single lines, but on a regional basis following those conduits. And most importantly, we have great depth penetration beyond 1500 meters, which we don't get with traditional MT uh, or sorry, EM on such a large uh, for cost scale. Great. Hart Jansen wants to know, what has the response been from the local communities and are there any First Nations involved with the project? Um, I, I'll start with that. Um, the town of Marathon is uh, the home to uh, John McBride. Um, the town, um, the few times I've been up to site, Carrie's been up there, Rod's been up site, and I'm sure John could speak it, to, and same with Phil if he's still on here, but the town is 100% supportive of, 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 of a mine getting built here. Um, there was a pulp and paper mill that closed down, I don't know, four or five years ago. Uh, Hemlo is, uh, was a big employee. Uh, they're starting to do contract mining, so they're starting not to wind down but slow down. Um, the town is doing well right now because they're um, the home construction site for a new power line that's going through uh, uh, for, on top of our property. Uh, but the town is supportive of this. Um, uh, uh, the relationships with the First Nations, uh, John and Tabitha, uh, myself and our team has been in constant con uh, contact with the First Nations. Uh, we believe um, there's a, a good relationships uh, with them. So uh, we're in constant contact with them. John, would you have anything else to add or on that? I just, I think there are relationships we've built over years um, before generation that we've maintained. And with Generation coming in, they've done a wonderful job to continue to grow um, those relationships, especially going moving this project back to uh, towards production. Question here from Alex Santa Maria: uh, What are your expectations as far as mine financing? I know you've discussed royalty sales, take or pay contracts, etc. What sort of financings will you be pursuing, and what kind of timeline uh, for these financings once you complete the feasibility study? Do you want me to answer that, Jamie? I got that. Sure, got go that one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks, Alex. Um, I uh, did. Did that get deleted? I no, can't, it, it just moves over to published. Okay, sorry. I I, I don't know how. Sorry, carry there. This program works. Um. I'm going to throw it to you, Jamie. I think you have a, a better internet connection. So just to repeat the question, uh, what are your expectations as far as mine financings? Uh, you've discussed royalty sales, take or pay contracts. What sort of financings will you, will you be pursuing? And what kind of timeline for these finances, financings once you complete the feasibility study? Um, I don't. I don't know if it was mentioned earlier. I don't know if uh, Carrie could hear or not. But uh, there is no streams or royalties on the main deposit. Um, we haven't looked at that angle, but we know that's something we can certainly look at. Um, as of right now, we haven't really actively looked at um, the project financing. We're waiting to get the economics, and I think once we have the feasibility study out, the economics will dictate on probably the best way um, we should get this financed. And, and as we know from the PEA, the numbers were quite 
quite fabulous, so we don't think uh, financing this project will be an issue. I think it's the best way to do it, which is at least dilutive for our shareholders, um, is, is what we uh, want to do. But first, we want to look at the sequencing uh, of the mining, and there's obviously a lot of variables in here, but uh, um, it'll be something we're going to look at um, when we have a better idea where we're at in the feasibility study. So um, it would be something that we would look at um, probably around the same time that we have a production decision, which will probably be right after we have the feasibility study. So hopefully all that will be in the, worked on in the next six months. Speaking of, I have two questions for you that uh, piggyback off, well off of what you just said. The first one is, what is the timing for the release of the feasibility study? And the second one is, what would you ballpark as the timeline to get into production? Carrie, there. Uh, the feasibility study uh, will be hopefully out at the first quarter of 2021. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be January or March, but uh, that's our timeline, first quarter of 2021. Um, an aggressive timeline for us to have for production is uh, if we have um, all of our uh, ducks in order and if we have government support and uh, First Nations support, we would hope that the permitting could be a little bit shorter. Um, the governments are looking for uh, shovel-ready projects. They are looking for um, projects that will bring um, economics to the area. This will create a lot of direct jobs, a lot of construction jobs. Um, the town of Marathon needs the job. Uh, Northwestern um, Ontario needs the work. Um, obviously, we know that the governments need the tax revenue, so it's a win-win-win for everybody. Um, a bunch of work has been done in the past for permitting. We're not looking to take any shortcuts. We're just looking to get this over the line. So um, to answer that, uh, um, to answer the question, we're, we're, we'd be hopeful by the uh, um, the end of 2023. At the end of 2023, we could have uh, um, a commercial production. Excellent. Uh, rehashing something that I know was brought up before, but just in case folks missed it, Hugo wants to know who are your institutional investors? Um, well, uh, I'd bring the page back up, but uh, um, the Sibani, uh, which is, I don't know if they're an institutional, but they're another corporate. Uh, as mentioned, I think they're an $8 billion market cap company. Eric Sprott isn't an institution, but he should be. Um, <laughs> so he's a large shareholder. Cisco Mining is an institution, but um, they're another issuer. But um, they have um, they have uh, they have a big uh, share base. Uh, Lucas Lundin through his family trust Zebra, um, again not an institution, but uh, bigger than a lot of institutions, is a shareholder. And then we have um, some other people, whether it be RBC or whether it be Dundee. Um, some of the other those some of those other funds are involved there, but they're not reported because they're not over. 10% so at any point in time so those are what we have um, and you know again once Carrie answered that other question that's where we need to get some more institutionals back institutions into the name is kind of our plan and that's why all this marketing is what we're trying to do excellent uh, question here from John Mason he says Sunday Lake uh, Impala and transition MT success is a great analogy and very real who is your MT contractor at Marathon? I think we mentioned this earlier, but uh, we've contracted Quantech to do the work. Perfect. A question here from Nermina, uh, who's asking, how advanced are the environmental and hydrogeology, geolo hydrogeology there you go, studies? How advanced, um, John? You want to you want to go with it, or I can? Sure. Um, so, uh, Tyler LeBlanc, our environmental manager, is running our environmental program in the EA process, and they've done extensive work uh, back in the Stillwater days over the years to get up to an EA um, level understanding, and uh, they've continued to do the monitoring over the years and the transition into generation. There are can, we are continuing to do those work that work, um, and, uh, but they are well advanced. Excellent. So th there are no further investor questions. I have one last question for all of you before I pass it back to uh, you, Jamie and Carrie for the final word. What are each of you most excited about for the next six months? Throw to John to start. Oh, the drill program and the MT targets. Obviously I'm an exploration geologist. We have people in the field and we're gonna um, create some excellent targets and hopefully have some success drilling some massive sulfides. Yeah, so I'm with John and, and uh, you know, despite the fact that there's over or almost 1,100 drill holes in the property, it's 200 square miles, 200 uh, square kilometers, 
most of those drill holes are in existing resources. So really very little on the exploration side. So there's huge exploration potential here. What say you, Jamie? Um, I agree with them. That would be nice. And maybe to be able to go for dinner up at Marathon or go for dinner anywhere sometime. But uh, <laughs> let's get a drill. Let's get a drill hole first. Awesome. You have to come out to Oakville, Jamie. <laughs> exactly. Great. Gary? Okay, here's Kerry. I think that one will be a mystery for another day. So without further ado, thank you everyone for your questions. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, for anyone who didn't get a chance to submit a question or uh, if you another question has just come up, uh, feel free to send along all of your questions to either Jamie, his email and phone number is on the screen right now, or you could send it to us at friends at six.com, that's six ix.com, and we will make sure that Jamie and Carrie and the rest of the team get it. Um, Without further ado, Jamie, I'll throw it to you for the final word. Um, thank you, Bianca and the team at Six. You did another fabulous job. And uh, thank you for everybody that joining in or, and stayed that extra 11 minutes. We really appreciate it. Um, we think we have a very good story, a very compelling story. And, uh, um, and I just hope everyone uh, keeps an eye on the stock and stays safe. Great. Take care, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.